I don't, I never had time. There was guys I was with were killed a lot, and they died. And I don't remember any of the things you're saying uh -huh. bothering me. Uh -huh. There's this great relief, it wasn't me. There's this guilt after it's over, why wasn't it me? And why I don't deserve, and he was a better man than me. He had a family by me, so this guilt carries with us all our life. I think. That's a sad part. But at the time, no. And God bless the Marines. They tell you what to do when you're trained. Do this, do that. Bury the bolt. Turn your back. Uh, that's a concussion grenade. That's a 40. So your training is all there. Do the next thing you're supposed to do. And then there's a guy there telling you, come on, we're going to move. And so I was always busy in my mind doing what the Marines said. And this business you read about, you don't want to let your buddies down. That was a big thing for me and the guys I was with. But there were some that were not heroic at all. They quit. They would go back and say, I'm not going to fight this war. Some went back to the beach and just got on them. Anything that was going back out. Uh, three or four of them, my good friends, uh, just said, as soon as they hit the beach, I'm not going to do this. And I'm getting back. And we said, you're going to get shot. You're going to get court marked. I don't care. So everybody's not brave. But the majority, by far, of all the guys had what the Marines, I think, and still this don't let the other guys down. We are a team. And that's another thing you think of when the guy is hurt. What happened though, they just sit there and they sink and they sink and try to to zoom in on that. The poor driver and his assistant, they're just sitting there so helpless. They don't want to get out of it. We're trying to help him. He's gunning the motor. He's got a four-wheel drive. And Does any of those beaches look familiar like the ones you were on? I'm trying, trying to spot where this could be. This could have been Red Beach, too. Could be any of them. Else. Mm -hmm. I guess it's about a mile of beach. So. Uh -huh. It's a good picture. But it gives you a clue that that first rise was tough. Mm -hmm. You can see these guys are mowed down here. Now, this was this was quite a bit after the D-Day because they're it's already you didn't bring a ship like that in on the first day. Mm -hmm. The uh, looking on that the map, um, I wanted to show ask you. I'm not trying to think where it is here. Oops. Here it is. Looking on that, um, can you describe for us um, the different parts? That, you know, of the terrain, well, like what was uh, hilly and, um, or was it, what, what was the terrain like there? There's Suribachi, I don't know what, 500, 500 feet high. A big inactive volcano with a big bowl in the middle, like a punch bowl. And the guns all trained this way, knowing we'd come in this way. Mm -hmm. They had communications, wires and underground, to this part of the island. The commanding general, Kurabayashi, had his headquarters up here. There's 22,000 men on this island, and you can't find any of them. They're all in the ground. And so it wasn't the case of when people say, you see these pictures of people walking around in war pictures. Nobody, there was nothing to shoot most mm -hmm. of the time. But that was airfield number one, and that was the big one. That was the most busy. They were using airfield number two, and they were building the airplane, airplane. airplane port number three. This was not used. Mm -hmm. This one, when we took it, we come up the hill, and they did. I was not part of that. I got about this far up. Uh, but we, the military, used this for the main airfield mm -hmm. for us. And I, I was back here when the first B-29 landed, back in here. Mm -hmm. And that's another one of those funny things. I saw this B-29 come in, and it's awesome. It's big. We had never seen things like that mm -hmm. up close. And he lands, and there's a cloud of dust. And the door opens, and out comes this boy. He can't be more than 18 years old. He's got a hat on sideways like a baseball cap. And here again, I thought, Marines worry about me and this $95 rifle. Look what they gave this kid. <laughs> These were children. It was amazing. I mean, uh, when you think back, all those pilots and all those big planes and tanks, they were in their early 20s. Wow. I mean, today you look at a kid in his early 20s think, would you give this guy a B-29? <laughs> awesome.
Um, they, they got the job done. The, uh, as far as bunkers in the, in the worst part of the fighting, um, it looked like you it was here, right in the center. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's when it stopped. They, they got up here pretty good. This was pretty flat, mm -hmm. but here it was hilly. Now it's very craggly and hilly, and we had bombed it to death. There was no more vegetation, no trees to speak of, nothing standing. They had had a little village here. They had some Korean laborers here. They had a woman or two, I guess nurses of sorts, and we ran into their bodies. Uh, but mostly it was all 22,000 Japanese soldiers. Was there, the you described um, getting hit with the hand grenade and, and two uh, fellow Marines uh, getting hit and killed. Was there any other Marines that you recall being hit or uh, really uh, returning fire? Any other combat situations that you can recall? other than those two that stand out? No. The guys around you get hit, they fall, uh, some of your friends, and many times down here at the beach, bringing back wounded and having your own guys get hit, you're close up and there's time. There was. We had a chance to talk for a moment and what happened. But up here, it was time just all runs together, you're awake half the time, you're asleep half the time. Another thing they did, when we were in there, in the thick of it, in the evening, they would pass down the line little bottles of brandy, like you get on an airplane. I don't know where that stuff comes from. Another thing, unbelievable, we came back again, like off the lines, and we're hiding behind a cliff, and a jeep comes up as close as he can get, and two guys come up from the jeep, ducking and running, and they bring us up a pot of, a, a jerry can of hot coffee and apple turnover. And you think the cooks are back here doing their best, you know? Ah, Everybody's doing their job. Yeah, yeah. Very touching. Yeah. Like apple turnovers. We hadn't had anything to eat good. You were eating cheese out of the can and everything. Wow. Apple turnovers and hot coffee. They got it up to us. Little things like that, you remember. And the brandy would just make your stomach real warm. Here again, I'm 17 years old, so. Wow. You look back and think, were they trying to get us drunk and make us crazy? <laughs> I guess any way they could pick up the morale. Um, yeah. When, if you had to recall one uh, act of courage or two acts of courage, uh, of personal courage, what comes to mind? Do you recall any? Yeah, lots. Um, the bottom line with me was in training and all the while in camps and all the while you're before you go in there, a lot of the guys you're with look like they'll be heroes. They just seem to do everything right. And they'll tell you, I'm strong, I will be tough, I will be good. And you believe in them. And then you see guys that you think, boy, when the shit hits the fan here, they're not going to be worth a damn. They're not going to be very good. They don't do anything with the dog out of everything. Well, I learned none of that matters. The guy that you think is not going to do anything, he's fearless, and, or can be. And the other guy that's always lazy turns out to be really a great, brave man. And the guy that's always strutting around half naked, showing off himself, he's hiding in the corner. Appearance and talk, everything changes when the bullets start to fly. Wow. And I learned to respect the people that I didn't have a lot of respect for before. And I, when, 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 he, when he was needed, he was there big time willing to give his life. Whoa, it was impressive. And a disappointment when the others didn't. Mm -hmm. But they were usually big mouths. And you look back and thought, he was always tough. And now when, when you need him, he's not here. Wow. Sort of a letdown. Mm -hmm. you know? But I remember being very thrilled in, uh, with some of the guys. We had a guy named Joyce. And bullets were flying everywhere. And nobody could move. And he just, we needed bullets bad. And he snuck back somehow, and he got a bandoliers all over his body, and he was crawling and creeping and coming up to us, and we were waiting so if somebody could get some bullets up to us, him one bullet. He was nearby, and they saw him, and they started shooting at him, the Japanese, they were shooting everything at him, small arms. He just stood up, and he looked at the Japanese lines. He said, I'm sick of it, I'm tired of it all, just go ahead and shoot me, go ahead. 
you were all thinking, he's dead, you know. <laughs> and they all stopped. More than once, I remember, they would just stop and look at us. What, what part of the island was that where he stopped? Out here at the beginning. He just stood up. And no kid, we thought he's crazy. He thinks he's dead. And he didn't die. It's one of those crazy things in combat. I think. Yeah. And they would holler at us all night. We would holler back. And when we'd holler back, they'd shut up. And they would holler. It was funny. They'd say, Shirley Temple, eat shit. <laughs> Roosevelt, eat shit. Uh, and we'd holler back at them. And then they'd, they'd not holler anymore. Uh, and we were told, when they holler, you holler at them. Wow. And when they came, they hollered, and so we hollered too. As soon as you went after them, you start hollering. We're going to go get that. Okay, everybody, whoa, 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 make a big noise. Wow. I thought, this is dumb. But <laughs> Did you ever run across a uh, situation where it was hand to hand combat? No. <laughs> wow. Thank God. Um, God. God bless the guys that did that. Talk. Yeah, I'm sure you've been to a number of reunions through the years. What? Uh, in, uh, you've probably heard uh, stories from your buddies. Uh, in your time, time in the Marine Corps or at reunions afterwards. Do you recall a story from somebody that you know that's uh, either an act of courage or something just off the wall, like kind of like you mentioned, or something that's uh, worthy of us repeating a story? can't think of any. I so. Um, but there's a thousand of them because of the chaos, you know, and, oh, yeah. and the strangers. I have another one, if, I, if you don't mind, I'll tell you. Sure. I was a salesman here in Houston, moved here, and one day, drive, I used to talk on the phone, and there was a, a, a black girl, if I'm allowed to say that. I knew she was black by her voice, and, and she worked for General Electric, and I bought my stuff from them. So she's in the gold-domed building on the Southwest Freeway around Kirby. It's a bank building, and it's got a gold dome. I think it's still there. I was driving by, and I knew she's in that building. So I drove in, middle of summer. In 1974, and I went in there, and the man came, and he said, "Can I help you?" And I said, "I want to see her." He said, "Well, she's not here. She works here, but she's not here. She went to lunch." And I said, "Boy, it's hot." He said, "Yeah, it's hot." And I said, uh, so, "Anyhow, I said the Pacific. One of us said the Pacific. And, you know, I was in the Pacific. I was. I was in the Marines. I was in the Marines. I was in the Fifth Marine Division. I was in the Fifth Marine Division." Now we're looking at each other. I said, "Well, I was with the one Iwo Jima." He said, "I was with the one." I said, I was in the 28th, I was in the 20th, I was 2nd Battalion, I was 2nd I was Fox Company. He said, I'm Fox Company. Now we're glaring at each other. Now I joined them in the battle, but I stayed with them. I went back and stayed with them through Japan and everything. And so I thought, he's got to be original or else he's faking here to me. And he had a little limp, big guy. And I said, I was in the 3rd Platoon. He said, I was in the 3rd Platoon. I said, Corporal Unger was my squad leader. We're down to 13. He said, Corporal Unger was my squad leader. And I said, I carried the BAR. We're glaring at each other. He said, I carried the BAR. I had replaced him. Wow. Is that a story? Wow. You can imagine. Well, now, what was this fellow's name? Rusty Parrott. Rusty Parrott. I later hired his son. Isn't that something? Is he still alive? Mr. Parrott died, his son is alive, Mrs. Parrott is still alive, and I know a gentleman that uh, lives near her. Rusty Parrott. When, when did he pass on? Oh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago now. He had a limp. He had been hit and hurt, and he was taken off, and I, in effect, replaced him. Isn't that something? You can imagine that confrontation. Yeah, looking at each other. Are you lying? Like, where is this? <laughs> where is the road going to meet here? Yes, it wow. had to be, in effect, I... You know, out of 13 guys, he was gone, I, I went in. So now, I, what was he doing as far as work in this building? He was a salesman for General Electric. Oh. And I was buying stuff from General Electric and reselling it. Oh, I see. A distributor. You know, wow. Isn't that something? His son went on to be the place kicker at Rice University for while he was there. Wow. And then, I, then he went to work for GE. What's his son's name again? Rusty Parrott. Same Rusty. as his dad. You know, and I think the, the boy now is in Dallas. Wow. You know. And, uh... But old Mrs. Parrott still lives out on Richmond. And uh, did he ever uh, mention how he got hit? I don't remember. We we probably did talk about talk about it. But I'll be darned. Isn't that something? Small world. Yes. That's a good example. It's small world. Golly, that is. You, know, you walk into a place, I, I've often thought, you go to a restaurant, you look over there, and there's an old guy sitting there, and you think, gee, maybe we were 
real close at one point in life. Yeah. Especially in the Marines, because you were closer. A any other unique stories like that that you recall? <laughs> no, I'll tell you another funny one. After I was wounded, I was laying in the hospital on Guam. They flew me out and flew to Guam. There's a lot of cots on Guam, a lot of guys are laying there. And the guy beside me, a Japanese hand grenade had gone off and he had like sat or turned his back on it and it had exploded and just hit him all through his back and then it got him in his private parts and his rear end. And so he was really hurt. All those little tiny pieces from this concussion grenade, they don't kill you, but they were in him, like a bunch of splinters, hundreds of them. So he's laying there very sensitive on his tummy. I'm on my tummy because of my, I'm hurt in the back. Uh, the doctor would come by and change mine, then he'd go over to him. Well, when the doctor got to him, they took tweezers, and they would take every chance they got, pull pieces out of it, and would take it out of it. This had gone off and hit his wallet, and actually pushed into his rear end were pieces of his wallet and money. And the doctor said to him, as he pulls these things out, he says, son, and your ass is a gold mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed. <laughs> he didn't laugh. <laughs> he just funny. laid there uh, in pain, I guess. He just lay there. It was hurting. And this was on Guam. On Guam. Ah, was, but he died. Just we waited to get <laughs> You don't recall his name? No, I didn't even know him. Ah, but Just a Marine who was wounded. Ah, but he Funny died. stuff. That is. It's one of those... Uh, those funny things that happened in the Marine Corps. The, uh, interesting. Well, is there anything we, we, uh, well, let me ask you this. Um, there's been a number of prominent Marines uh, served in the Marine Corps. Um, you mentioned uh, John Bradley. What, what do you call, recall of John Bradley? I didn't know him at all then. He was the corpsman in the outfit. And my only contact with him would have been when I was wounded. He was still there. He was wounded on the 12th. And I remember the name, but I thought it was Sergeant Bradley, is my memory. Sergeant Bradley was the guy that they gave us BARs. They said, get rid of the rifle. We need firepower. So we all went down. There was a box, BARs. So we all got one. And we had trained in these in the Lejeune. So we knew how to handle it, all of us. So we all took a BAR left our beloved M1 that we had had with us all our life, left it later. I went up on top of a little ridge, and the guys were down below, and I could see ahead where all the Japanese territory was. And the sergeant was a little bit further down, and I got the VAR set there, and I'm looking, and it was in the morning. Here come a Jap walking right towards me down the trail, about 100 yards out there. He's coming out of a cave, and there's little smoke coming out of the cave. I didn't know if we should shoot him or not and give our position away. So the sergeant there, I said, Sergeant, Sergeant. He said, What? And there he was. The guy's walking down a path, boat legged, and he stops. And I got him right in the sight, so I got him right there. Mm. And he said, What should I do? <laughs> he said, Shoot him. Shoot, shoot that son of a bitch or something. Uh -huh. And I had incited. And people ask me, did you ever shoot anybody in the war? I pulled the trigger. And the BAR, as you know, fires on the forward motion of the bolt. I looked out and that bolt was going real slow. And the sergeant said, shoot him, shoot him, shoot him. And I got the trigger pulled. It was full of cosmoly. It was a brand new BAR full of grease. And it wouldn't work. And that Jap walked in the cave. He said to me, he said, that son of a bitch, he's making chow, and you had him in your sights. <laughs> so he made us all go back, and we all got back behind the ridge, and we all fired in the air to clear those weapons. Wow. <laughs> they wouldn't work. We never thought to clean the grease out to cause relief. Uh, yeah. sure. But I had him in there. You know, he looked back and think, God spared me. I never really pulled the trigger on the guy. Do you ever re remember hitting a guy? Yeah. No. No. You never saw them. You never he saw He sprayed. Yeah, right. And who would have shot him? Right. And they taught us, no, no Jap is dead unless you kill him. Right. So we'd say, okay, let's go out to Jimmy's car, and then we'll go across to that house. Right. So they say, you go first. Well, you go out there, 
and you turn around, there's a dead Jap laying there who had been hiding behind that car. You got to shoot. Mm -hmm. So every other you watch it, go bang, get your bang as you went by. And so many times you go by on a guy there with 30 holes in them. But everybody, we were all taught, you see him, shoot him. Right. You know, take no chances. Right. Wow. Um, did you know, uh, of course, you later became three star general, Lieutenant General Lawrence Snowden. Snowden. He was with the 4th Division, so you would have never run across him. Um, our guy was Rocky, I guess, our division. But Severance, your next guest, was Easy Company. And ours was, my captain was Naylor. And in a training program on Hawaii, in between the battles, I almost shot one of our own tanks with a bazooka. The bazooka had a sight that was falling off. And they said, shoot, shoot. And I shot, and it, I hit the cactus up there in the island. And around the back of the cactus came one of our tanks. And the captain called the whole thing to a stop. Who did that? It was me. Mm. And he got up and he lectured me. You could have killed all those people. And he didn't want to hear nothing about that sight. And he really poured it on me bad. Mm. And then he got up on the side of the hill and he said, you guys are all going to die. He said, I'm glad I'm not related to any of you. You are the stupidest bunch of, you're, no way you're going to make it. He was really tough. Where was this training at? This was in Hawaii, Hawaii back yes. on the island of uh, Hawaii. And then the war ended and we all went to Japan, like I say. I found him after the war and I wrote to him and he was down in the, one of the other guys knew where he was. But I wrote to him and I told him that story. I said, you really read me off. But I said, you, you made a man out of me and I want you to know that and try to make me feel good. And he wrote back and he said, thank you, I can use all the nice words. He said, we had heard he was a shoe salesman. He said, well, you know we made fun of all the officers. He was supposed to be a shoe salesman from upstate New York. And I said to him, was that, was that true? And he wrote back, he said, no, I didn't have a job at all. And he said, I came back to Newark, and I took a job as a porter with Beaver Brothers. And he said, I knew if I could get in, they'd never let me out, or they'd never want me out. And he had just retired as the international sales manager for Beaver Brothers. Exactly. Well, that's something. Yeah. That's something. Right. He spent his whole life there. And then I wrote him again. And his wife wrote a letter back. She said he fell dead. Uh, she said he was painting shutters out on the porch and he fell dead. He was at Kiowa Island, a retirement place in South Carolina, down by Hilton. Right. So, wow, that's too see bad. Story. Yeah, but I didn't get a chance to thank him and say some nice things to him, and I felt better about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the op, you mentioned your company. Who is your company commander again? And Captain Naylor. Naylor. Yeah. And, um, uh, was that the individual you just were talking about, Captain yeah, Mayor? Um, was, uh, what about your platoon sergeant? Did you ever run across him uh, years later? No, that was Corporal Unger. And, uh, well, no, I guess he was our squad leader. He was a corporal. I don't remember the sergeant at all. But Corporal Unger, we stayed close, and, and uh, we would go on these hikes and trainings with the wax that we did in Hawaii preparing. And he was salty. He, we would pack our pack for a three-day trip, and he'd tell us all, put everything in there. You got to take your blankets and everything. And he'd fill his pack full of beer. And he'd go out and drink beer. <laughs> he was salty, or we didn't mess with him. But I understand he died in a alcoholic, he was drunk driving in Chicago. He was uh, killed you know, not that long after the war. I guess he was from Chicago, or yes. Yes. Wow. That was. I knew a guy in Milwaukee. Is you know, the family. Was, Last name was Unger. Unger? And I was out at Dow Chemical uh, a few weeks ago. I ran into guys from Unger. I said, hey, are you related to so and so? Because uh, it's a kind of rare name. Yes. You don't hear it too often. Yes. Um, what, as far as any decorations in your unit, was anyone uh, decorated that you're aware of? No, and that's part of the bad side, I guess, of the service. Unless some officer writes you up, as I understand it. Uh, God bless them, the guys that get them, but as you can imagine, there's so many that don't, and nobody sees them, and then they die even, and they do something very, really brave, you know, they die. Um, I'm very proud to be a Marine because of that. I think the Marines excel at this sort of thing, and uh, I'm lucky to be alive, and proud to be among those guys that were able to do that. And I think the charm, too, was that they took a bunch of us like me, civilians. Most of the guys that I was with in boot camp were drafted. And that's when me and that 
that corporal that was angry with me, we got started. He said something, and he said something to me. He hollered at me about something, and I listened. And then he said, "You goddamn draftees!" And I couldn't take it. And I said, "Sir, I wasn't drafted. I enlisted." And he, now I made a fool out of him. I guess he, but seemed to have started then. But I was very proud at that time. I was enlisted, and these other guys. But in fairness. A lot of them had families and you felt bad for them. They really were riding home and they felt sad at night. I, I was happy go lucky. <laughs> Told my mom, I'm having a good time. <laughs> I never ate so good and I gained 20 pounds. Wow. I was just a boy, so. The, uh, uh, as, as far as a mentor in the Marine Corps, uh, who comes to mind? I guess really in honesty, those DIs. They, they do a magic. That was Corporal Long? Lem. Lem. Lem and this other man, and it's just, I keep thinking, thinking Johnson, but I'm not sure. I can't find any way to find out who that was. You know, a lot of the records got burned right. in Paris Island. Mm -hmm. So I, I tried that, and that didn't seem to work. So. What about, um, you know, Marines have so many years of uh, uh, such an illustrious history in the Corps, and uh, so many prominent Marines since 1775. If you were to name one or two of Marines in Marine Corps history that uh, um, you've admired or enjoyed reading about or, or, or what have you, who comes to mind? I get Leatherneck Magazine and I read about some of those old-timey guys. There's an Irishman, Riley or... Daly? Daly. Daly, Dan Daly. Some of his exploits. Uh, Certainly Smedley. Smedley Butler. And certainly Chesty Puller. Uh, I don't know that I admire them so much. It's like Lee Iacocca and this Jack Welch. He, they were the man for the time and the place. I was the president of the company for a long time. I don't know that I'd have hired any of these people. They are troublemakers. They are individuals. They are rough. Uh, but they were perfect for what was needed at that time. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's like a politician, Bush, Clinton, all them guys seem to be the one you need at that time. Uh -huh. And it doesn't mean you have to like them or they're popular or they're the best, but they got the thing done that needed to be done. Uh -huh. You have to admire that. They have a single-mindedness. You can't hurt them. Pete Rose, I think the baseball player, probably no fun to be with at all. But he could, he could do what he was asked to do. Uh -huh. And I think George Washington, all those people, Jefferson, they had a single-mindedness of, and the Marines are loaded with that mentality and they have the environment to let it blossom, if you will, mm -hmm. and still stay within the strictness. I tried to raise my seven children with some of that discipline, and they know it. I would say, in the Marines, if someone said, hit the deck, you didn't stand there and say, why, is something going on? You went down. After a while, you learn. And pretty soon, any order you got, you just did it. You didn't. And I tried to get my kids, and I would tell them, in case you start touching a hot stove, I want to say stop. And you will not turn around and say why, or you just stop. I don't expect you to be military, but if you're crossing the street, I know a truck's coming, or I think something, I want you to freeze. When I say freeze, the Marines did that for me. It saved my life. And I think that's parental and not a bad thing at all. <laughs> There's a discipline that's good. That's great to hear. You had seven children. Wow. And they're all healthy and still living. Yes, and they're all okay. So. Great. Another one of my great funny stories, sitting at one of the reunions, Larry Ryan is sitting beside me. Larry Ryan was in the same outfit, F Company, in the original 5th Marine Division, landed. He, today, he lives up in Milwaukee. He obsesses that he was in that picture. He says, that's me. He said, it's not Bradley. <laughs> <laughs>